Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Chem 104. We're starting chapter 3. I'm going to break up chapter 3 into two parts. The first part is just going to be kind of the introductory. Here's a lot of vocab. Here's how they're related, that kind of thing. And then the second part is going to be a little bit more math heavy. So for the first part, yeah, there may be a couple of questions where you might want to reach for a calculator. But the second part for sure, you want to have your calculator handy. We're going to start off by classifying matter. We talked about matter in the first chapter. It is the material that makes up all things. It's anything that has mass and occupies space. It's a pretty big category. So we're going to give you some vocabulary words to break down what matter is. And then we'll talk about some other things um, to relate to matter. So. We'll start with pure substances and mixtures. Those are kind of the two big buckets that you can put matter into. Pure substances have a fixed or definite composition. They don't change. It doesn't matter where you find it. it doesn't matter. It always has the same composition. A mixture will contain two or more different substances. They're physically mixed but not chemically combined. So that's a, a key that you want to make sure you remember. Mixtures are physically mixed, but not chemically combined. Under the pure substances umbrella, we've got elements and we've got compounds. So remember, a pure substance has a definite composition. That means elements and compounds also have definite compositions. An element is a pure substance that only contains one type of material. Copper, lead, aluminum. They're the things you, found, you find on the periodic table. So anything on the periodic table, that is an element. Compounds, you're taking two or more elements in a definite ratio. So table salt and table sugar are two things that we can definitely relate to. Table salt is NaCl. So that definition of one sodium atom, one chlorine atom, those two come together and they form table salt. That's always what table salt is. You never see Na2, right? It's always NaCl. Now we just talked about this. Table salt contains sodium and chlorine. The composition is always the same. If you decompose salt, then you get two elements, sodium and chlorine. That's a key note. When you decompose a compound, it yields elements. Eventually, that's what you get to. So we just covered this side we talked about pure substances and how elements and compounds fall underneath that. Now we'll talk about the mixtures. Remember that a mixture has two or more substances that are physically mixed, but not chemically combined. You can have different proportions. So you can have a mixture that has the same two ingredients, but those ingredients can be present in different proportions. And these substances can be separated by physical methods, like filtration that's shown in the picture. In a homogeneous mixture, the composition is uniform throughout. So you can't tell 
that you're looking at multiple different substances. One example is brass. Brass is a solid. It's used to make fittings and things of that nature. It's a homogeneous mixture of copper and zinc. You wouldn't know that just by looking at it. But it's a homogeneous mixture. Another example of that would be table salt dissolved in water. If I sat a glass of salt water and a glass of plain water next to each other, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You would only know if you tasted it. And I would never do that to you. That's me. Another example of a homogeneous mixture is mixtures of gases. So if you've ever gone scuba diving, if you know anyone who's gone scuba diving or you know anything about it, you know that you have to have some kind of oxygen containing gas mixture while you're underwater. We're not fish, right? Some of the examples of homogeneous mixtures that you can use while you're scuba diving is nitrox, which is oxygen and nitrogen together, heliox, which is oxygen and helium together, and trimix, which is all three. I ain't doing no scuba diving. You ain't gonna catch me doing no scuba diving. That's about as much as I know about scuba diving. You have to breathe while you're underwater, and you have those tanks <laughs> on your person. Nope, not for me. If you want to do it, have fun. But, mm-mm, I've been put on land for a reason. Okay. We covered the homogenous mixtures, where you can't tell that they're multiple things mixed together. Now we're covering heterogeneous mixtures. In those, the composition from one part of the mixture to another varies. So if you have a piece of metal in water... This is my generic beaker. I've got some water in there. And I throw in some kind of a metal. Copper is not black, but that's what I have access to right now. That's a mixture. It's water and a metal. But you can very clearly see where the water is, where the copper is, or the metal in the beaker. So it is visibly different. That's the classification of matter. I would suggest that you have this chart in your notebook. And when you're studying, you can kind of go through and, you know, make sure that you can check, you know, what definitions go with which word and that you have examples of each on lock. So there are examples here of each of these terms, elements, compounds, homogeneous mixture, heterogeneous mixture. But if those examples don't work for you, I'd encourage you to add some more of your own to one, make sure that you understand the difference between these terms, and two, you have something that kind of is ingrained in your brain a bit better. So when you're doing your homework and you're doing your exam, you can pull from those examples. Let's do a learning check. Identify each of the following as a pure substance or a mixture. Letter A, there's pasta and tomato sauce. Well, we've got a combination of two things and we can absolutely physically separate those. So it's a mixture. Aluminum foil is just aluminum, so that's a pure substance. Helium, that is also a pure substance. It is an element. Air is a mixture of gases. It's got oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, all sorts of stuff in there. That is a mixture. If you wanted to, for the, for the mixtures and pure substances, you can write down as extra practice 
whether or not it's a heterogeneous or homogeneous mixture, you can write down if it's an element or a compound. So that's just some additional practice you could do here if you'd like. Let's do another one. This is identifying each of these mixtures as homogeneous or heterogeneous. First one, hot fudge sundae. Somebody must have been hungry when they're putting this together. You've got a bunch of different components. The ice cream, the hot fudge, um, what else do you put on there? Whipped cream? I don't be making sundaes, but I know it's a lot of, di a lot of different things. And if it's a lot of different things and you can see those visible different parts, that means it's heterogeneous. Shampoo. You can't really tell that there's a bunch of stuff in it, even though there are lots of components to shampoo. It all looks like one thing. So that's going to be homogeneous. Sugar water, same thing. If you've ever made Kool-Aid or anything like that, iced tea from the, from the dry mix, you're pretty much making sugar water, right? You're mixing all that stuff together. Maybe it changes color. Maybe it's one of those mystery Kool-Aid flavors. Either way, you can't tell just how many things you're mixing together. It's all one thing. That means it is a homogeneous mixture. Peach pie. There's the crust. There's the peaches and the kind of syrup. So there's multiple parts. You can see them. They're visibly separate from each other. That means it's heterogeneous. Make sure that you can do these kinds of examples because your exam won't just have, you know, chemical examples. It'll have kind of real life examples as well. Now that we've covered the types of matter, we need to talk about the states of matter and property so we can continue to build our vocabulary. First, we'll cover solids. And this information you've probably encountered if you had chemistry. Um, and it's just kind of stuff that you encountered even in elementary school and middle school. So this should be some review and some new information. Solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. So you're not going to just crush it, you know, they're not going to expand or compress based on where they are. And the particles are close together in a fixed arrangement. That means that they have high interaction. There's lots of interactions between particles. And those particles move very, very slowly. Liquids, on the other hand, they have an indefinite shape, which means if I have 50 milliliters of water, I can pour it into a beaker like this, right? A bigger beaker. Or I can pour that same amount into a smaller beaker. It'll just take on the shape of the container that it's in. But the volume of water is still the same. It's still 50 milliliters, like our example, in each of these beakers. It's just that the shape of the water has changed. The particles in water are close together, but they're still mobile. They move slowly, but they are mobile. Since they are close together, they kind of have medium interactions, those particles.
not super strong like the solids kind of somewhere middle of the road gases have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume which means that they will take on the same shape and volume as their container gases will just infinitely expand in a room and you can also compress gases a lot their particles are very far apart which means that there's no interaction between the gas particles and they move very very fast this table compares all three states of matter and it has everything that we talked about the shape volume arrangement of the particles interaction between particles and their movement along with examples I would encourage you to have this in your notebook or at least have it easily available when you're doing your homework this is a great study tool where you can kind of recreate the chart yourself and fill in the properties of solids liquids and gases and it'll help you think of examples just trying to give you some study tips along the way. Here's another learning check that I encourage you to do. So pause the video here, try this learning check, and then you can check your answers. Identify each description as that of a solid, liquid, or gas. It has a definite volume, but takes on the shape of the container. That's our liquid. Remember the water that you can put into any size cup you want. It's still going to have the same volume. Its particles are moving rapidly. That's a gas. That's the only one that moves fast. Its particles fill the entire volume of a container. What that means is that it will expand to fit the volume. Again, that's a gas. Its particles have a fixed arrangement. When we see fixed, you should automatically think solid. Its particles are close together, but moving randomly. That's a liquid. Solids are fixed. They're very close together and fixed. Liquids are close together, but their particles still kind of wiggle and move around. One more learning check. This is to identify the states of matter for each of these. Pause it, do it. It may seem a little bit silly, but just make sure you know it. First one, letter A, vitamin tablets. Those are solid. Eye drops are liquid, they better be. And air in a tire is a gas. We'll do more practice of this nature in class. Moving on to properties. We'll talk about physical properties first. Physical properties are things that you can observe or measure without changing the identity of the substance. You're not doing any chemistry. You're just taking note of what it's like, the shape, the physical state. Is it a solid? Is it a liquid? When does it freeze? When does it boil? The density. These are all properties that you're not going to change anything about the substance if you get this information. If you boil water, it's still water. If you freeze water, it's still water. The composition is still H2O. If you measure the density, say you you know you put some water into a a cup or something and you get the mass of it you know the volume mass divided by volume is density that doesn't change the identity of the water i like to relate this to kind of if you're interested in looking at an apartment or a house you're observing oh what color are the walls is this hardwood flooring underneath this nasty carpet 
what are the countertops made of? How many bathrooms does it have? Those are the physical properties of the house. And by looking at those things and taking note of how it's designed, how many rooms, you're not doing anything to the house. You're not changing anything about it. You're just observing its properties. So the physical properties of copper, just to put that into context, it's got kind of a reddish orange color. You'll see a lot of cookware using copper. And now kind of the fad is to have these copper finished um, kitchen gadgets. So now everything looks coppery. It's shiny. Uh, metals are shiny. Great conductor of heat and electricity. It's a solid. It's got really crazy high melting and boiling points because it's a metal. Those are the physical properties of copper. A physical change. Now we're talking about changing the state, changing the shape, but it still doesn't change the identity or the composition of the substance. So if I take liquid water, which that's what water is, it's liquid, right? and I freeze it to make ice, well now I have a solid. It's still H2O, composition has not changed. If I have a tree and I chop it down, I'm gonna shed a tear, but it's still, it's still wood, right? I can, I can chop up the tree I can make lumber, all these things. It's still wood. It's still just a tree. So you can change the physical shape of it. It's still wood. Now let's do a quick practice to identify each of these as a change of state or a change of shape. Chopping a log into kindling wood. We're chopping it up. Kindling wood is just small pieces of wood that you would use to start a fire or to keep a fire going. So that's a change of shape. Water boiling in a pot. We've got liquid water and it is turning to vapor. That's a change of state. Ice cream melting. Ice cream is kind of solid-ish, right? And then when it melts, it's definitely more liquidy. So that is a change of state. We'll do more practice, of course, in class. But make sure that you get these terms down. That's the, that's the biggest thing. There's a lot of terms here. And now that we've covered physical properties and physical changes, we also have to cover chemical properties and chemical changes. You'll want to keep those things separate. So the idea of what a property is versus a change, and then a physical property or change versus a chemical property or change. Again, we'll go over all this in class too. So chemical properties describe the ability of a substance to change into a new substance. So it talks about what kind of reactions can a substance do. When a chemical change takes place, you're taking one substance and turning it into something else. So a chemical change is really a chemical reaction. So instead of it just being what something can do, it's what is happening or what has happened. During a chemical change, the new substance that's formed has a new composition. It's got new chemical properties, new physical properties. 
So one example that is delicious is flan, okay? It's got caramelized sugar on the top. And when you caramelize sugar, you're using a lot of heat and you're actually changing the properties of that sugar. You're changing the flavor profiles, which means that there's different compounds that are in caramelized sugar that are not present in just regular table sugar. So you're doing something to the sugar with that high temperature that's causing its properties to change. This table has some examples of physical and chemical changes. Be able to tell the difference between the two. And this table has physical and chemical properties and changes. So it's examples of all of those things. Make sure that you can tell the difference because that's one of the main uh, goals of this is to be able to tell the difference between these four terms. And you'll be given like, you know, papers is torn. You know, is that a physical property, physical change, chemical change, chemical property? And you'll have to choose which one it is. We'll do practice like that in class. And we'll also do it here. Wouldn't be complete without a learning check. So here we're going to look at properties and determine whether they are physical or chemical. So ice melts in the sun. That's a physical property. Or excuse me, a physical, yeah, a physical property. We don't have any chemistry going on. There's no, we're not talking about the potential for ice to do something. It's just a change of state. Paper can burn. That's a chemical property. We're talking about the types of things that paper can do and burning is a chemical reaction. So paper is capable of taking part in this chemical reaction. A silver knife can tarnish. Same exact idea with B as with C. A magnet removes iron particles from a mixture. Well, now we're just physically sorting things. Um, a magnet, we're talking about the properties, right, of something. And it's, it's physical. We're not changing the properties of anything. We're not doing any chemistry or talking about what chemistry a magnet can do. We're just talking about a physical property. Now we're going to identify each of these changes as physical or chemical. Burning a candle, whenever there's fire involved, it's a chemical change. Ice melting on the street, that's a physical change, it's a change of state. Anytime you see something about cooking, so you're toasting something, you're caramelizing, roasting, whatever, that is chemical. Heat changes things, and it makes them tasty. Cutting a pizza, that's physical. We're just changing the shape of the pizza. Iron rusting in an old car. Rusting is a chemical reaction. Now, we're in North Carolina, or you may not be. Maybe you're somewhere where it's colder. I have lived in colder states, and rusting vehicles is a real issue. Be lucky if you are in a southern climate. You are lucky. So we've talked about matter. We've given you a lot of vocabulary words. Now it's time to talk about temperature, and we've got a few other concepts. This video, uh, if you noticed at the beginning, I talked about it. This is only part one. So this is kind of the light work here. Make sure that you tune in to part two for the math. Temperature you already have an idea of, right? 
It's just a measure of how hot or cold something is compared to something else. We use a thermometer to measure the temperature. There's several different temperature scales. There's Fahrenheit and Celsius, which I'm sure you've heard. We typically report our weather and things like that, you know, recipes, what you heat your oven to in Fahrenheit. Pretty much everybody else uses Celsius, but hey, that's all right. The temperature difference between boiling and freezing of water is divided into smaller units, and those units are called degrees. So on the Celsius scale, zero degrees C, that's when water freezes. 100 degrees C is when it boils. There are 100 degrees between freezing and boiling. Fahrenheit though, a little bit special. We freeze at 32 and we boil at 212. So there's 180 degrees. between those two. Why 180? I don't know. I would have chosen a round number like 100 myself. There's also the Kelvin temperature scale. The units are Kelvins, which is just a K. There's no degree symbol in front of it. There's no negative temperatures. It's an absolute scale. So when you see zero Kelvin, that means absolute zero. There's no negative temperatures. The coldest possible temperature is negative 273 degrees Celsius, which is zero Kelvin. This is a nice visual that compares the three temperature scales. So you're looking at the freezing and boiling points of water in three different temperature scales. You can also see normal body temperature here in the middle. We need to convert between these. And converting between degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit is fairly simple. We have a different number of degrees between freezing and boiling for Celsius and Fahrenheit. So 180 degrees Fahrenheit, that difference is the same as a difference of 100 degrees Celsius. Because we're just talking about the difference in our freezing and boiling points of water. There's 180 degrees between that for Fahrenheit, 100 degrees difference for Celsius. You can write a temperature conversion. This one's going to change your Celsius temperature into Fahrenheit. That changes the degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit and then adjusts for the freezing point. That's what the plus 32 does. You can rearrange that and solve for your degrees Celsius. So those two equations are going to be handy. You don't need to memorize them. I'll give them to you for the exam. You're going to see it pretty much look like this. There's also converting from Kelvin to Celsius and vice versa. So for the Kelvin temperature, you take your Celsius temperature and add 273. If you want to go backwards, you take your Kelvin temperature minus 273. Note that you cannot directly convert degrees Fahrenheit to Kelvin. You have to go from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius to Kelvin.
So let's do a practice of just that. Convert normal body temperature in degrees Fahrenheit to Kelvin. Normal body temperature is about 96.8 or 98.6. And the first step is to convert our, to our temperature in Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius. So when you do this math and you take into account sig figs, you get 37 degrees Celsius. You take that 37 and 273 and you get 310. Make sure that you can do this kind of problem. You can throw your own temperature in there, do the calculation, and then you can check using Google. But on the exam, you won't have access to Google. So make sure you understand how to use these equations. So what have we covered so far? We covered matter. We talked about how to classify matter, states of matter. We talked about temperature, which we can also use to talk about matter. Now we can talk about energy, how we make this matter move. We've got kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. And this is probably familiar to you if you've taken any kind of high school physics. Examples of this are swimming, water flowing over a dam, that's how you can make electricity, working out, all of those things are kinetic energy. Potential energy is energy that is stored for use at a later time. So the water that's sitting at the top of a dam has potential energy because it can fall down, right? And that's kinetic. A compressed spring that spring can boing, you know, expand, and that is kinetic. Potential energy is also in the chemical bonds in gasoline, coal, so all of our fuel. Also, people fuel and just organism fuel, food, right? There are chemical bonds between all of the substances that make up our food and our bodies break that down to make energy. Here's a learning check to identify whether or not we're talking about potential energy or kinetic energy. Pause it, do it, double check your answers. Even if it's like, ah, oh, I got this. Just make sure, you never know. You don't wanna lose points for a silly mistake rollerblading absolutely kinetic and I cannot do it for the life of me I will wipe out every time peanut butter and jelly sandwich that's potential anything that has to do with food my kids love PB&J they will you promise them PB&J you will have them for life maybe not I think they're pretty loyal to me but they like those sandwiches a lot they'll think about it Mowing the lawn, very kinetic. And doing that in a North Carolina summer, let me tell you something. You own a house and have to mow the grass. You will be rethinking your choices. Gasoline in the gas tank, absolutely potential and a blessing. All right. Since we're talking about energy, we have to talk about heat because heat is another form of energy. It's the energy that's associated with moving particles. The faster you move, the greater heat you've got, the greater thermal energy. If you have an ice cube, 
you keep adding heat, say you just leave it out on the countertop, that's adding heat. The particles in that ice cube are slowly moving. And they're slowly moving faster and faster as they heat up. And eventually, they have enough energy to change from being ice, which is a solid, to liquid water. For energy, we use the SI unit joule, which is a capital J, or kilojoules if we're talking about a lot of energy which is a thousand joules. Remember, the K means kilo. You can also use calories. So that's a lowercase c-a-l. Or you can talk about k-cals, again, kilo, 1,000, little c calories. The k-cal is what you see on Nutrition Facts. And it has a capital C. That is the same as a KCAL. A calorie is defined as the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. You will absolutely need to know this um, equality. It will be provided for you when you're doing calculations. But just be familiar with this. One K cal or one calorie, excuse me, is equal to four point one eight four joules, and that is exact. That is an exact number. So no sig figs to worry about there. Here's an energy comparison of different resources and different uses, just to give you an idea of energy usage, energy in the body, energy in terms of fuel, the sun, just kind of putting things into perspective. Let's do a learning check. How many calories are obtained from a pat of butter if it provides 150 joules of energy when metabolized? We know the joules. We need to know how many calories. That's our question. We know this equality. One calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. From here, we need to figure out what our conversion factors are so we can choose the right one. We can put one calorie over the joules and we can flip it around, put the joules on top and the calories on the bottom. Let's write our equation. We're starting with 150 joules. In order for joules to cancel, we need to have joules in the numerator and joules in the denominator. We've already got joules in the numerator, 150 joules. That means we need to choose the conversion factor with joules in the denominator. So that's the first one. Our joules cancel. There's one on the top, one on the bottom. We're left with calories now. When you're putting this into your calculator, you're taking 150 and dividing by 4.184. When you do that, you get 35.85 K 
calories. And this is from your calculator. But we need to consider sig figs. There's only two sig figs in 150. So with two sig figs, our answer is 36. And that's C. This is an extension of what we've been doing in Chapter 2. If writing equalities, conversion factors, choosing the right conversion factor to get from point A to point B, if any of those things pose a problem to you, please reach out because you will need to know how to do this for the rest of the course. If it is difficult now, it will be even more difficult at the end of the course when you've got all your final projects, finals are coming up, and all the things, and you need to know how to do this, and it's a struggle. So please reach out if this problem was difficult. We're going to pause here for now. So this is the first part of Chapter 3. Make sure that you tune in for the next part so you get the full chapter. Again, the next part will require your calculator because we're going to be doing some more energy calculations. Thanks again and stay safe.